for uh, taking time out of your day. Uh, I'm Dan Gilmartin. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Sales for Ware. Uh, we're a recent addition to the eBay Inc. family. We were acquired by PayPal about four months ago. Um, I've got a, a couple guys up here on stage with me, and I'm, I'm really psyched that they're here uh, to talk about uh, uh, and, and help to uh, demystify mobile advertising. Um, and, and what I thought we'd do is, in sort of a traditional sense of a, a journalist approach uh, from an education perspective to uh, what we're talking about in demystifying local ads, is talk about the, uh, the five W's, the who, what, where, when, why, and we'll throw in a how. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about where at the beginning, um, a little bit about who we are, what we do uh, in particular, uh, but then I want to uh, pose some questions to uh, my fellow panelists, uh, the, really the experts in the field, uh, and get their perspective and share their perspective with you guys and, and help educate uh, on this topic. Um, the, so the, the who, what, where, when, and why, um, let me just talk a, about a couple of those really quickly. The when. Uh, is now, and I think as you see some of the information that uh, we'll share with you, um, mobile advertising is a, is a pretty hot uh, area, um, lots of money being spent, um, and, and lots of opportunity being created for merchants uh, and, and uh, companies to attract a, an audience uh, in the local ecosystem. Uh, where, uh, that's kind of easy because that's just who we are, um, and I'm going to throw in the how, um, and we'll talk about uh, some case studies. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, fellow panelists here and introduce yourselves. Um, I'm Mike Schneider, but I go by Schneider Mike. It's a very long story. Mike Schneider's the Tony Hawk of fingerboarding. I can't own him in SEO. But I run uh, digital for an agency out of Boston called Allen & Gerritsen. Uh, we're a What's Next agency, um, and mobile is one of my focuses and obsessions. I also wrote location-based marketing for dummies with Aaron Straub. I'm Mike Boland, um, and I feel out of place because I only have one screen in front of me up here. Um, so I'm a, I'm a mobile analyst, um, and I always have trouble describing people what I do as an analyst. I guess I analyze things, and I used to be a journalist, now I'm an analyst, and they're very similar in that you, you stand up and kind of pretend like you know what you're talking about. Um, but uh, BIA Kelsey is a market research and consulting firm. For those of you unfamiliar, um, we focus on all things local. It's kind of like a Gartner or a Forrester in that it's an analyst firm, but our focus is a lot narrower, um, and we've been around since the 80s doing that, and that used to really mean you know, yellow pages, newspapers, um, radio, to some degree television, but within the last 10 years, of course, local has really broadened and exploded um, with the inception of mapping and online search and social, and then even more so in the last few years with mobile um, and having you know, obvious ties uh, to local, being location aware and going with you. Um, so that's my coverage area and we throw conferences and I write papers and forecasts about this topic and really try to follow where it's going and it's really just an exciting area, as most of you know, um, and I'm also excited to be here, so thank you, Dan. Great, thanks guys. Um, so uh, just a quick show of hands, uh, how many of you guys are from out of town? And if you keep your hands raised for just a second. Um, how many of you have used your phone in the last 24, 48 hours to find something locally? Pretty much everybody that, that you know, was out of town has used their phone in the last 24, 48 hours to find something locally. Um, so that speaks to the power of mobile um, and, and what, what this new medium has created uh, for us as we travel or, or even if we're uh, in our hometowns. I, I live in Boston and use my phone all the time to find new places to go. And so there are a lot of folks, there are a lot of advertisers uh, that, that would want to be able to reach us as we're using that device uh, and try and send us a message and try and change a, a, a behavior or a pattern of where we may go, where we may shop, where we may dine, where we may drink. Um, and then another quick uh, raise of hands for um, uh, developers. Uh, how many developers out there? Okay, good, nice. good amount. Merchants? Any merchants? A few merchants out there? Great. Uh, perfect. So lots of developers, guys, so we'll uh, organize our thoughts along that line. Uh, so uh, really quickly, I just want to share with you a little bit about where, uh, what we do and, and uh, our, our role within the, uh, uh, the ecosystem. So 
uh, there's, there's two components to our business. There's a consumer application. I encourage you to download it uh, uh, after we're finished here. Uh, but it's about local search and recommendations. Uh, we, take, uh, we build a profile on you uh, in terms of what you like, what you dislike, and then make recommendations uh, based on um, uh, local areas. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, but we uh, created a, an ad platform uh, a couple of years ago to help monetize our consumer application experience. Um, we've, we handle about 4 billion ad requests on a monthly basis. Uh, we work with about 350 to 400 publishers, uh, folks like Pandora and AccuWeather and Weather.com, Flixster, and a number of others. Uh, we, we deliver the ad units that you see within those applications. Um, we've got about 120,000 uh, advertisers on our platform uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and we've created a reach of about 58 million uh, consumers in the U.S. alone. Um, as an application developer, uh, we felt it was really important uh, if we were going to create an ad platform and allow uh, businesses to reach uh, that audience, um, reach an audience, that audience had to be really, really big. Hey, Dan, uh, close your eyes for a second. How many Wear users in the audience? <laughs> Oh, not bad. Nice. Hey. Okay. And, and, and an enthusiastic <laughs> one back there, waving hands. Yeah, appreciate that. I counted as two, I think. Um, so it's a little bit about our platform, what we do. Um, and, and a lot of this is built in, I don't know if you guys were at the Solo Mo uh, presentation yesterday, but my colleague Greg Warden uh, talked about our place graph. And our place graph is a, um, it, it, here it's a visual representation of a relationship between places. Uh, I think Greg had the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. I, Figured I'd do one on the Moscone Center because that's where we are. Um, but we look at the connections between places and, and the connections between police, places and people and people to those places. And that's the, the, uh, the core of our relevance engine that we've created to help uh, direct people to uh, good places based on specific interests and, and how those places may be connected. Um, we believe that relevance uh, in, in advertising in general uh, and specifically in mobile is really the key. Uh, and that key is delivered by a simple formula that location plus context equals relevance. Um, you know, what is, what is it that I'm looking for when I open up my phone? Um, what do I want to engage in? Where do I want to shop? Where do I want to eat? Where do I want to drink? Um, and, and the, you know, that being the context and where am I? Uh, so, so how do I uh, engage with a, uh, a service provider or a company that's nearby uh, to fill that need that, that I have? Um, quick example of, of an ad unit, a, a type of um, advertisement that you can create on our platform. This is a little coupon uh, um, uh, thing that we created, uh, launched it a couple weeks ago. Pretty simple, point and click, um, but it allows uh, anybody in, in sort of the local ecosystem to create an, an ad. It's all self-service. It, it's an independent platform. Uh, create an ad, um, uh, determine uh, where you want to deliver that ad based on a zip code or based on a proximity to your business, whether it's a quarter mile around your business up to 10 miles around your business, but deliver that ad and attract that, that local audience. Um, so enough about the, the, the where uh, part. Um, I, I want to get into the why. Uh, so why mobile? So we have a couple slides here, and, and I want to turn it over to these guys to talk about uh, why mobile and, and uh, what we're starting to see and what we have been seeing in the last couple of years and what we'll see in the future, the trends around the growth in mobile uh, and how, like a lot of you guys that raised your hands, how you're engaging uh, the mobile device to find things locally and, and, and how that's driven uh, by advertising. Uh, so, Mike, um, we've got a slide here that, that talks about the growth of, uh, of mobile in compared to other mediums out there. Um, and it, and um, one of the other analyst firms out there has said that uh, mobile will grow faster in the next five years than any other, than, than, than uh, other um, uh, mediums, uh, whether it's TV, uh, radio, broadcast, things like that. Um, what, what are you seeing from a, the analyst perspective uh, on the growth in the category? So. I mean, there are a lot of different data points we can kind of point to as leading indicators for this opportunity. One, I think, of course, is starting with usage. Um, you know, mobile right now is about, mobile, the mobile web, I should say, is about 100 million users in the U.S., um, and that's about 40 percent of the overall mobile subscriber base, and it's about 30 percent of the overall U.S. population, and that's growing quickly. I think it's IDC that um, has forecast uh, mobile web users to surpass in number desktop web users by 2015. Um, and a lot of that is basically being driven by smartphone penetration. Um, that might be an obvious statement, but smartphones right now are about 40 percent, according to Nielsen, 
of the overall U.S. mobile subscriber base um, and, and growing quickly. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's not just the, um, you know, that's kind of the starting point, looking at how quickly these things are growing. But also if you look at, um, you know, what that means, um, certain data points that I look at um, with respect to the opportunity for mobile advertisers or mobile developers that are building tools that are ad supported is to look at how well ads are performing or how well content um, is performing in this mobile context. So it's not just a quantitative analysis but a qualitative one. And in that respect we're seeing things like click through rates for example um, for mobile banner ads are about 10x on average what you see on the desktop. Um, I, as a side note, I personally don't think the CTR is the, the right metric to use to measure mobile, but in terms of that kind of apples to apples comparison, um, as a proof of concept to some online benchmarks, it's interesting to look at that. Um, and, and then that, you know, 10x CTR will go up even higher when you start to do other things like targeting based on, you know, behavioral targeting or location targeting to get to your point about location. But um, uh, those are just a few quick thumbnails about maybe, you know, some of the data we're seeing that's really um, a leading indicator of the opportunity to, to plant a stake in mobile. We, we'll talk about metrics uh, in a little while, mm -hmm. um, but, but CTR, click-through rate, is, is a, a measurement uh, mechanism to define how well um, we're doing in, in advertising in general. Uh, and, and I have a, a thought that in the future, uh, we're not going to measure click-through rate. We're, it's a different CTR. It's cash to register. So how effective is mobile uh, as, a, as a medium to drive consumers to uh, um, have a commerce transaction either on the device or, or at a local uh, store? Uh, Schneider Mike, any, any thoughts on that one? What's the question, Dan? Thought, thoughts on, on the, the future of how we're going to measure? Um, well, I mean, click-through click rates and view-through rates especially um, really scare me. And, it, uh, you know, I, uh, I was, when I started doing advertising, it was on the analytics side, so I built some um, database marketing and analytics groups for companies like Hill Holiday and then Allen and Gerritsen. But, um, so this, this idea of click-through, not so great, but uh, the idea of call to action is always what I would strive to. And I think that's basically what you said, cash to register. So you define what the call to action should be and getting people to actually do that is much better than just getting someone to click. Now you've got to say, all right, well, how many people saw it? And, and, and um, the, the click-through rate is helpful because it tells you it tells you uh, the number of people actually saw, and if you take that click-through ratio, the, the ratio of click-through to call to action, and you can say, all right, am I actually getting eyeballs on it? And it tells you if it actually works or not. So that is valuable, but it's not the most important one. The, one, the things that I like are engagement type metrics. Are people, are people taking that ad? Are they inspired by it? Are they passing it on? Because my goal as an advertiser, and the reason that I got into advertising, I'm a tech guy like you guys, like a lot of those developers. Um, I spent 10 years building uh, data warehouses for Fortune 500 companies and double-blinded clinical trial simulators and stuff like that before I got into advertising. And, and then I got into CRM and then that moved me into advertising. So my goal is to get into this stuff and reduce noise and make everything feel like content. And so it's a different set of engagement, of, of metrics. You start to talk more about engagement metrics that get you to a, um, to get you to that particular call to action versus something like just a click-through rate. Because cl if, you, if you look at click-through rates, particularly on the web, they're minuscule. And we get excited over, you know, raising it like a hundredth of a percent. And I can't get excited about that. I just I can't. Do you have any sense to, to riff on that a bit that, uh, you know, we've inherited some of these metrics. It might be clicks, it might be impressions mm -hmm. from media that was, that it was built for another medium and now it's being shoved into something unnaturally. And the, the example I always give is that, you know, in the early days of television, the ad format was a guy standing there reading a paper off of a script, probably smoking a cigarette. Um, and that's because that was the way it was done in radio. Don Draper. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, it was done in radio. It took a few years later for television ads to come into their current highly annoying form. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's basically a, you know, a progression. But I think there's also, uh, there's an evolution there because in the beginning when we started to, we didn't look at things like awareness, you know, as a metric. And, and that's important. Brand awareness as a metric is very important because it drives sales. We know that. But we used to just look at, okay, this is the spend and then to sales in those Mad Men days. And then at some point, direct mail comes along and we start to look at direct metrics and we're like, oh, we've got all these interesting things that we can 
that we can optimize against. And we got statisticians that come along and they start to build models and they want, you know, they've got all these variables and they've got all these, uh, these uh, different metrics that they want to try to optimize against. So why don't we try to put that into, like you said, into other models. And I think we've got to, we've got to, that has to evolve. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, as, as you look at the evolution of mobile advertising and, and uh, I've been uh, peripherally and, and now uh, specifically involved in it for the last eight years, um, it's, it's changed pretty dramatically. Um, you know, I think thanks to smartphone penetration, 40% uh, uh, in the U.S. now, um, you know, we've got these great engaging big screens that we can touch and uh, manipulate. And, and I think that's, um, as a medium, it's changed the sort of passive nature of being in a car, uh, listening to the radio, sitting on the couch, watching TV. Um, any specific thoughts on, on, on what's driving some of that? Is it, is it just great smartphones? Is it great screens? Or is, it, is there a consumer element to this? I, I think so, and I'll point out one more thing about this data point. Right now, the 40% pertains to current ownership. If you look at current sales, it's much higher than that. So if you imagine the hardware replacement cycles of 12 to 18 months, um, we're set to surpass 50% um, by um, Q2 or Q3 of, of next year is what was what Nielsen's predicting. Uh, but to answer your question, um, yeah, I think it's the form factor that enables that type of activity. Yeah, one, and then two, um, you know, the fact that it's portable and location aware brings you beyond just, you know, on the couch where you take that interaction with you. And I think that based on the form factor, because it's decidedly smaller, um, the, the, the corpus of things that you can do on the device are decidedly narrower. So instead of all the things you do online at home on your desktop, you know, which can include researching a term paper or watching YouTube or looking at porn or, you know, whatever the case may be, um, that's decidedly narrower on the mobile device where, you know, you don't want to do a lot of finger tapping, you're not sitting on your couch, you may be, um, I guess where I'm going with this is in, in many cases that correlates to a higher degree of immediacy um, and that equals higher degree of commercial intent which I think gets back to maybe why those CTRs are higher, um, why we're seeing this as a big opportunity because people are taking it with them and the types of searches they're doing are more commercial in intent. Google has said um, that 40% of its searches on the mobile device have local intent. That compares to only 20% on the desktop. So I think it's, sorry, a big long-winded way to answer your question of the, the form factor enables different types of behavior but also um, it goes in the other direction as well. People that kind of have the certain intent gravitate towards the, the form factor that is more conducive to that, I guess. So, so a great engagement mechanism, but um, uh, as, as developers, as advertisers, as we're going to create the content and create the, the interfaces for uh, the, the audience that we're trying to attract, we've got to be really, really smart about what we create, how we create it, what the uh, engagement process is with the consumers, um, something I think Schneider, Mike, you, you focus on a lot. You're all about consumer engagement. Some thoughts we're, on that? We're definitely about that. How many user experience designers do we have in the audience? Any? So um, user experience is something that we're obsessed with at Allen and Gerritsen. I mean, we, uh, we're a creative shop at the end of the day. So um, we're trying to get people to do something. And one of the things that you hit on before, Mike, but you didn't, you didn't put this specific word in the mix, so I want to introduce the word friction to the mix here. And, Consumers want a reduction in friction on everything they do. I mean, basically, at the end of the day, we're all lazy. We want to be able to do things in the easiest way possible so we can get on with our lives. And this form factor is easier than this. And this is smaller, easier, quicker, nimble than this for some things. So we're, we get obsessed with the reduction of friction in processes. Cool. So um, just a, one more slide uh, on the sort of why part of this discussion. Uh, you know, why mobile? Um, uh, so, uh, Mike, this is a slide from you uh, talking about the anticipated ad spend mm -hmm. uh, between local and national uh, over the next five years. Um, huge, uh, $4 billion uh, in, in, in ad spend, 70% coming from uh, local. This is, this is pretty impressive sure. um, and, and a little scary. Yeah, uh, it is. Know. If you pan back at look and look at the overall advertising market, or even the, lo the local advertising market, which is about 150 billion, um, you know this is so small. So I mean, if you really, it's, it's still going to be such a small percent, and it doesn't really take a lot of share shifts in moving people moving money from television or radio or other massive media. It's just because they scale so much greater, it's not going to take that much of a share shift to get to some of these numbers. But essentially, we look at um, um, SMS 
mobile search and um, display and ad supported video, um, add them up and what we've seen is that um, going from last year about 800 million and this is just US for now, um, going up to 4 billion um, in 2015. Um, and this year it hit, it got, went over, um, or it's going to by the end of the year hit um, over a billion for the first time. Now this particular slide is one breakdown. I mentioned we break it down by format, SMS search display, um, but also um, by local versus non-local. And this is, you know, another kind of why type of indicator of, you know, where you might want to plant your stake just because of the growth we project here. Um, and a lot of people are surprised when they first see this, especially in the outer years, 70% um, being local. And, and first, I guess this def uh, deserves a, um, a quick definition. We, we determine or we define local ads uh, as those that are targeted based on the user's location. So it can be a big advertiser or a small advertiser. It matters more where the user is than where the advertiser is. And it has some sort of geo-targeted component. It could have locally relevant ad copy or it could have locally relevant calls to action. But I'll, I'll give a, f just, I don't want to take up too much time on this slide, but a few quick reasons why we see this growing so quickly. One of which being that, you know, there are two segments of advertisers, the local, sorry, national local and local local. National local are the big guys that are targeting locally. And like we were talking about earlier, as they're evolving into the medium, um, that involves lots of things. They're learning that this device is touch enabled, it has an accelerometer, um, and it's location aware. So it's that last one where we're going to see a lot of growth, a lot of evolution on the part of advertisers who so far have mostly just taken their other digital assets or campaign objectives or creative even and just put it on a smaller screen. So as that happens, we're going to see that national spend targeting locally go way up. We're also going to see the local local, so the mom and pops of the world. It's really going to move down market and democratize, you know, the same way we saw in the online environment over the last decade as tools like Google AdWords and other things really put advertising within their hands. I frankly think it's going to move at a faster rate than we saw with AdWords and paid search because for a lot of small business advertisers that aren't very tech savvy, um, the concept of mobile and driving things that mobile can drive, phone calls, foot traffic, is more uh, tangible and it resonates more with them than the kind of more opaque concept of paid search. Um, and, and then just lastly, um, it's not just going to be the volume of ads based on these other factors, but also the premiums applied to these ads are going to push these share shifts towards, towards local. And those premiums are directly a result of the higher performance we're seeing um, from locally targeted mobile ads. I've got all kinds of numbers as examples, but I think I've probably taken too much time of, you know, those, those particular metrics that are, that are boosting those, um, those ad values. I'm fascinated. You can keep going if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think, you know, sort of the collective uh, why is, is um, huge numbers, huge potential, um, uh, lots of consumers out there that are really engaging in this medium. Uh, so I want to switch gears a little bit to the how. Um, you know, what are the mechanics of uh, mobile advertising? What are these things? Uh, you know, we've got QR codes, we've got landing pages, we've got banners, uh, we've got different measurement criteria. Uh, we talked a little bit about click-through rates and, and user engagement and call to actions and things like that. Um, Schneider Mike, you, you, you can make this real. You've got clients out there uh, that are engaging in the medium. You're, you're um, advising them on what to do, what not to do. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your, your conversations with your clients and, and make this real. What are, what are the mechanics and, and how does this work? The client comes to me and says, I want to sell more product to more people at higher prices and I tell them how. That's pretty much it. No, and then they I, write an IO and, and they sign write it. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, clients are coming to me and saying, all right, we know that there's a way to engage an audience in a place that they are or there's a way to um, engage an audience in more places than just at work during the day when they're on their, when they're on their, um, on their laptop. I've got some stats here that say that people are using their phones at work, but they also use them during outdoor activities, at bars and nightclubs, in the bathroom. 75% of people, you guys are using your phones in the bathroom. You're not telling us. You're telling, you're telling the survey, though, the Tango guys. Uh, at restaurants, on dates, in movie theaters, in church. So this is really an opportunity for them to get to people and in in, in deliver what you said before, which is, um, you know, con content and, and uh, content when they need it. So delivering relevant content everywhere. Um, so my clients come and ask me how to do that. And I tell them that um, there are, you know, several different tactics that they can use. You can use, you know, with, with, it's different than the web. It's not just, 
Here's your website. Here's clicks. Here's paid search. It, 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 here's Google. Mobile is not the same as web. It's not a copy and paste. I mean, come on. It's not the it's same. Be easy. I mean, you can use the web on mobile devices, but you've got, you know, the the most popular and, I guess, one of the activities with the least amount of friction is SMS. And every phone can do it. Like 5.3 billion phones out there, just about all of them can do SMS. So that's good. That means that we can reach anybody that we want to. And um, that's global phones, by the way, not in the United States. Uh, and then, you know, you've got mobile websites, you've got, you've got the, the components that you have there, like, like uh, uh, ads and uh, things like that. And then you've got sort of smartphone apps and, and stuff like that that you can add to the mix. So people get really confused really fast. What should I do? And exactly. what, um, so we try to take them down a path of, uh, well, let's, let's dip your toe into it. Let's, do, let's start by texting. There's a company called o Oberto that, uh, the sausage guys, have you ever seen, you ever have their pepperoni yeah, or any of that kind yeah. of stuff? And they, um, they're really used to digital stuff. So we said, all right, um, so not we said, all right, the, the agency told them, okay, let's, let's start with, um, let's start with, uh, a, uh, uh, a text call to action, which is, we want you to, from the banner, we want you to text a taunt you know, they, they want you to taunt your friends, basically. So taunt, taunt people, it goes into a community, it drives people into this community, and then, so it, it drives them into a mobile community, but also a, a Facebook-driven community. And, and so there's, there's different ways to get people to, to interact, and you see that um, people are, are more willing to use a text call to action on a banner than they are to mm -hmm. click, click on a banner. So we're seeing, like, that's where the 10X is coming in. We're reducing the mm -hmm. friction. We're, trying, we're getting them to use their mobile device instead of a click to train themselves not to do because it has bad results, right? So there, there's things like that. But then there's, there's companies on the other end of the spectrum that are doing what I want to try to do, which is provide content to people. Like, we talked a little bit uh, in, before the session about a company called Graystripe, who what they're doing is um, they're, they're making these very rich ad units that can go on mobile. And, um, and they have Facebook, Twitter, and things like that integrated into them. So if you're logged into your Facebook account and you're inspired by this piece of ad, this ad that looks more like creative, it could be a video or something along those lines, or it can be highly interactive um, type stuff, you can just tweet it, or you can tweet it right out or send it right to Facebook. And I think something that would look really cool would be PayPal HTML5 integration in some of these rich units, so you could just buy it right there. You know, I, that's what we're getting to. Somebody get a note on that. <laughs> quick, quick note also to uh, riff on one other thing you said, which was the, um, you know, people are using different devices at different times. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few charts that I have that basically show the day part of, you know, tablet, PC, and uh, mobile. And if you look at the times where there are peaks and valleys, they all differ, you know, different times of the day. And I think that's just really emblematic of the fact that you want to be in all of these places to kind of optimize the touch points that users are having and get in front of them at the maximum amount of time. And then also separately, um, there are lots of studies I've seen, you know, the most recent one, Google and Nielsen, um, showing that, you know, if you are present, whether it be an ad campaign or whether it be your product and, and where you're, you know, compatible with different platforms, if you're present across, you know, many different screens or platforms, you get this um, eventual effect where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts in terms of, you know, whatever ROI you're going for, whether it be clicks or, you know, ad recall, or they, they basically throw a lot of different metrics against it, but um, essentially campaigns across these media can seed each other and cross-promote each other um, and really kind of prop each other up. There's a question here from the audience that they're asking uh, the effectiveness of banner ads versus QR codes. And um, uh, so I guess this goes back to the conversation I was having before. Um, it depends. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do and who you're trying to get to do something. Uh, QR code is awesome if you do it right. So if you want to engage that tech early adopter person and that's the audience that you want, you know they actually know how to do a scan, that they, they're going to have the technology on their phone, they're going to be able to scan a QR code. If you send them to a mobile optimized experience that gives them something to do, that's highly effective. If you send them to a, just your website, that's, that's crappy. They're, they're not going to like that. So um, the answer is it depends. It's, it's, it's all about the creative at the end of the day. It's, it's how creative is the execution? Does it, is it, it's that? And then it's, is it low friction? And, and can people take advantage of it? So net so net, the, the mechanics or the, the how mobile advertising is really looking at the medium, looking at the device and, and, mm -hmm. and how you want to engage uh, the consumer uh, through the app. And, and it can be SMS and, and it's a great stat that the prevalence and availability of SMS um, is pretty massive. 
Um, but you know, it could be an app, it could be a banner, it could be a QR code, a lot of different ways. And I think ultimately you've got to figure out uh, what's working for the audience that you're trying to attract. Uh, whether whether you're, you're working on behalf of uh, a brand or um, whether you're, you're just trying to draw that, that consumer into your experience on a mobile device or, or into a, a physical store, uh, hopefully to, to drive uh, commerce. And what, one more point on mechanics before you go on, um, and this draws out something you said about, um, you know, if you send someone that's scanned a QR code to a non-optimized page, um, it really ends up being a disconnected experience. I think that happens all too often, not just with QR codes, but it's really the art of the landing so page. Disasters. And you know, it's, we talk a lot about what should the ad look like, what should the ad copy, what calls to action, where should it be placed. Um, after all that, sometimes the ball is dropped when the, you know, where does the click go is an important question. And sometimes it goes to a non-optimized site. I've seen stats anywhere from 2 to 4% of all mobile websites are not optimized. Um, and that just ends up in, you know, an experience after you put in all this other work, you send someone to the wrong place or to the right place that just looks like crap. Um, so I think that's another thing to, to look at. I think the, the experience on mobile is so quick, right? You, you, yeah. you pull it up, you, you hit an ad, you, you know, it's not desktop where you have a little bit more time. Um, you know, and so we spend a lot of time looking at the, the mechanics of that landing page and, and what call to action do we want to drive. Do we want to click to call? Do we want to click to map or click to directions? Um, and so I think it's a, it's a lot of uh, research and, and definitely trial and error to figure out uh, based on, on, on that action you're trying to drive, you know, where do you put that call button, where do you put that directions button, and how do you call that out and uh, make it simple and really optimize it for um, that mobile device and, and that OS in particular. Um, I'm going to skip, it, skip ahead here um, and, and talk a little bit about uh, what, you know, what are advertisers doing. I, I've got a couple case studies. and. Um, you know, I think these guys have some thoughts on this stuff as well. So um, we were approached by Cadbury, uh, the makers of the Hall's Cough Drops, uh, last year. Um, and they asked us if we could uh, come up with a creative campaign. And so we took a, a data feed from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, where we tracked the flu index. And based on the uh, flu index spiking uh, in, in certain locations, uh, we would draw a geofence around the location of where Hall's cough drops were available, Walgreens, Walmarts, and CVS. Uh, we put a two-mile uh, geofence around those specific locations where the flu index was spiking and started to deliver ads. Uh, and so I think we saw about a 62% uh, increase in engagement uh, beyond uh, the, the static campaign that was running. Uh, so, so it's not just um, you know, looking at the content or the context um, uh, you know, purely in that form, but what else is going on environmentally around where that consumer is and, and how do we use the technology that we have to draw that, that very specific area and really use the technology as a targeting mechanism um, to, to deliver that ad unit, to deliver what that, uh, that advertiser is looking to do. Uh, another one that we did uh, last year was with uh, ExxonMobil, uh, where they just wanted to talk about some of the uh, energy efficiencies and, and drive engagement and, and um, um, you know, people into their uh, locations for, uh, to, to fuel up. And uh, so we did a two-mile geofence around 10,000 of their locations. Uh, not a trivial task, but it was something that was really specific. And if you think about you know, where, where you fill up your car, uh, you know, there's generally a couple different gas stations around there. So they wanted to make sure that when you were thinking about fuel for your vehicle, uh, that, you, that you were seeing their ad. It was another way for them to engage that audience uh, outside of, um, uh, of other advertising opportunities, whether it's in car, uh, but, but have something different that's uh, on the device uh, that differentiated them from uh, other uh, competitors out there. Um, guys, other, other campaigns that, that you've either done, uh, Schneider Mike, or uh, things that you've heard of that are really cool that, that really speak to the, the what part of this discussion? I, I can give a few examples, not of individual companies that are doing campaigns, but um, companies that I talk to that are, um, you know, overall seeing some pretty interesting results based on the ad products and the calls to actions that they've put in place. Um, you know, Google's one, they have a click-to-call, mobile click-to-call program where through AdWords you can opt in to have your phone number show up and basically drive a phone call to whatever number you designate. If you're a large advertiser with many locations, you can plug in your um, kind of location database and have the right number show up based on the right search based on where it's done. And what they've done is they're charging the same amount as a click for when a call is generated, just to keep it simple to generate awareness. And for a lot of advertisers, 
calls are a lot more valuable than getting a click. But my point is that what they've uh, done is they've seen an 8% higher click-through rate, which is pretty high when you're talking about search, um, just from entering these phone numbers into the, the, um, the text ad, the search ad. Um, and that's not just people clicking on the phone number, but even clicking on the normal URL, the presence of that phone number alone gave that ad a little bit more veracity. Um, Another example in terms of moving beyond the CTR and getting kind of closer to the cash register along that theme and, and evolving the call to action, a company called Duda Mobile, which builds mobile websites and also mobile ads, they started to prominently place click to call buttons um, throughout these landing pages and ads. And what they saw was an 18% um, click to call rate, which again is huge if you compare it to, um, you know, just 18%. 18%. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and that's basically a ratio of their ad coverage and then the calls that were generated from that. And, you know, the, the comparison to that is that I think we said earlier, a, you know, a, um, a mobile banner ad is about 1% CTR. Online is about 0.1. Um, it's about a 10x difference there. We're talking about 18% here. Um, and then my last example is Telenav, which is a navigation software company, and they, they are embedded in a lot of different um, handsets, um, and then also some in-dash systems. Um, they decided that they are already driving people, literally, uh, to locations based on the navigation that they, they will uh, generate. They decided to productize that as an ad format, um, and instead of a click-through rate, they call it a drive-through rate. So the ads that are placed within this context of navigation, they got a 3.8 click-through rate from those. And then within that 3.8 click-through rate, 25% um, actually generated directions. And they can actually tell the advertiser with a certain degree of confidence that we sent someone to your front door because that person went through every step of the, the directions. And they know that. Um, they're not actually tracking them by GPS, but it, the proxy is that they went through the steps of the, the directions. Um, so I think those are just a few examples of where we're moving and getting beyond the click-through rate and those calls to action that might make sense within these certain form factors and the context. Another interesting one is uh, uh, we, we talk a lot about at Allen Garrison about convergence of screens and getting mm -hmm. screens to work together. So um, you know you're, you're watching TV, but you're also on your laptop or you're on your phone. So they're trying to get you to to do something that that gets your get your eyeballs on the brand and. Um, this was a situation where Kraft had a new product that they were launching in Germany called the Jacobs 2-in-1 and then Jacobs 3-in-1, and they were thinking, all right, the best way to, to um, get people to, to get people involved in this product is to do trials. Now, trials are expensive, and they, they often end up in the wrong hands, so what they did was they put text call to actions on their TV, on DRTV, and on uh, print ads with about a 50 million person reach. They, um, they also did mobile banner ads on a, on a, bunch, of, uh, on a bunch of networks. Um, and uh, after three months, they got 500,000 sample requests. So basically, people are asking for the product versus nice. just them sending it. So pushing out 500,000 requests, and then 80,000 people. This is not to be underestimated. 80,000 people opted in for further communications, which is ridiculous. I mean, they built 80,000 of the 500,000 of the 500,000 opted in to, to for further communications via via mobile. Oh, that's huge. That's big. Huge. Um, so I'm just uh, cognizant of time here because I want to have some time at the end for Q and A. Um, and so I want to talk really about the who, right? So the who is the, the end consumer. Um, and I want to talk about their expectations and how they're engaging. Uh, Mike talked about the Google stat, 40% of mobile searches have local intent. Uh, Microsoft also has a, uh, some interesting data out there. 70% uh, of their mobile search, uh, it will be the search intent, uh, which is local in nature, will be completed within an hour. And, and so if you take those two points together, it's, you know, people are, are out, uh, they've got their phone, they're looking for something and they want to buy it, and they want to buy it now. Uh, Queens, I want it all, I want it now. Uh, I think that's the consumer expectation. Um, so, so what are we to take away uh, as a developer as we're looking into mobile ads and, and how we should build and what we should do? Um, what's that engagement look like and, and what's that expectation? How do we meet that expectation? It's got to be like That's content. a loaded question. It's got to feel like content. So we're in a situation now where we've got all this great data out there. We've got people's social data. We've got location data. And now we've got commerce data. And if we have, the more that we have access to that data, the better the ad should be, the better targeted the ad should be. So we're in, this is, I call this like a give to get. We're in a give to get uh, society now. So we've got all this, this data that we can, that we're freely pushing out there via Twitter, Facebook, Foursquare, uh, where, uh, and, um, 
and then also we've got all these great commerce systems that are coming out now. You've got the digital wallets, PayPal, Google, things like Level Up and Dwala, where, where we've got the convergence of streams, the holy grail of data, the social data, your, you know, your, 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 your social profile, and then you've got where they pay it off with the location and then how much they spend there. So we're knowing things like not only what the behaviors are, but what the size and share of wallet can be if you're, if you're, you know, uh, if you're working with certain, uh, certain data providers. So we need to make content that shows the people that we care. If you're, if you're, um, for instance, uh, for, for instance, if you're, um, if you're, if you're using Foursquare, for instance, and you and you go out and and uh, and you you check into Pizza Hut and you get a special that's like, the mayor gets free breadsticks, and you're in Topeka, Kansas. That's terrible. I mean, that's a terrible experience for somebody. It's better to it's better to say, okay, we know this person likes pizza. We know that they're a high value customer and give them something that, that they can actually take advantage of. We know they're from out of town because we've got their Foursquare data. They're not going to become the mayor of this pizza hut and get the free breadsticks. It takes two days, So right? is the expectation that they're going to get some kind of deal out of this? Or? Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a deal. It just has to be something that resonates with them. It has to be, it's either, it's, either, it's, it's, a, it's about value exchange. Value can, can be found in an experience, but it can also be found in your pocketbook. Absolutely. So, so Mike Bolin, we looked at some stats before, uh, $4 billion by uh, 2015, share shift from uh, other mediums into mobile. Um, you know, that, that's going to be driven by uh, advertisers spending uh, because they're uh, a anticipating this consumer engagement. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's your perspective on uh, uh, consumer uh, expectation? Um, what are they going to get out of this and, and why will they engage? Well, I think Mike's right. It's the value exchange. I mean, um, and, and back to an example of Foursquare. I mean, I think that after a while, the novelty wore off of, of checking in just to check in. And then the novelty wore off of checking in to let all my friends know where I am. And the novelty wore off of checking in to get a certain badge. And I think that where they are now is now a value exchange that is based on monetary significance deals and things like that and that itself is even evolving you know in, in their 3.0 release they went from just having mayor specials to your very point because sometimes it's hard to get that especially as more and more people are competing for those positions um, and I think that um, you know it, that that's exactly what it is and also to bring up um, an example you used earlier of, of gray stripe and you know basically what they're doing is building ad units and having this code that you can embed in any other ad unit that is just a really um, simple and portable call to action and they have about 30 to choose from and that gets to this concept of you know different users will have different intent different advertisers will also be trying to uh, drive different behavior to your point near the beginning of this session of you know it, it should be you know the beauties in the eye of the beholder in terms of what the action they want to drive so that you know Grace Stripe will have 30 different um, calls to action and if you're a restaurant you might want your call to action to be you know a plug into open table to make a reservation or if you're an amusement park maybe it's directions or if you're a plumber maybe you want the phone to ring so I think it's it's really um, you know speaking to developers building the tools that allow the advertiser to embed the functionality that drives the actions that they want to drive one and then two you know to meet that user expectations of who their users are are they you know inclined to pick up the phone or generate a direction or check in um, so I think it's really having that, that broad tool set available and then letting um, you know the advertiser or the publisher or whoever you may be serving kind of customize that experience because it's just it's so broad versus kind of the the siloed world where we're coming from in you know television and other other media and, and even to online where it's just a narrower set of metrics that we look at. All right, we're we're, we're coming up on our time here, um, so I want to do a, a quick um, 140 characters or less. Uh, where are we going to be in 12 months? What what's this uh, ecosystem going to look like? 12 months. So um, so Facebook. 140 characters. So Sorry, Foursquare won, Foursquare won the check-in war. So what? Facebook has it all in the background. They're going to become your. They're going to become more like your concierge because they know they know your location. They know it's not all about where you are. It's where you've been. And they're going to start using that to to push relevant offers to you, and people are going to be able to buy to pay for that service. Twelve cool. months. I would point to uh, mobile payments, um, seamless experience for the user to do what they want to do. Better um, analytics. ROI assessment for the advertiser, and it's it's really the holy grail. It closes the loop on you know the advertising we've been looking at for years. It's it's the holy grail and just getting to the register. 
Love it. Cool. We could have so, done a whole panel on that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a can of worms. Maybe I should. That was like one up. thing. Yeah. <laughs> a couple yeah. hours. Um, so I got a couple of links up there um, uh, for for our Wear Ads platform. Uh, if you want to uh, take a look at it on the self service side, uh, just wear.com slash merchants. Uh, and, and if you want to uh, engage with one of our salespeople on the full service side, uh, just uh, drop a note to advertise at wear.com. Uh, so I want to open it up to questions. Uh, I think I saw somebody over here. Yep, go ahead. That guy too in the middle. There's a microphone coming over to you. And I think we've got t shirts for the first six questions that come up. Oh, nice. I'm a developer. Um, I was hoping to learn about technologies I could use to put ad serving software, local ad serving software in my iPhone and Android apps. Is, are these links that will, do you have an API that will let me do that? Let's chat afterwards. I'll help you out. This guy's got a, a pitch for you on Twitter. Oh, for a question or for him? Oh, sorry. The um, can, can you guys uh, expand a little bit on, I'm surprised, Groupon, Scout Mob, Living Social, and stuff like that, those platforms, can you comment a little on how they fit in the ecosystem right now? I, I can. I think because we're talking about mobile, um, the whole kind of group buying um, world that's really exploded over the last few years, it's going to take on new form now that we're talking about mobile. And it's going to be incremental because different deals that are conducive to that immediacy um, you know, Groupon has a 24-hour clock. It has a redemption cycle that could be weeks or months long. Um, and as that business kind of plateaus, the growth is going to be had in some of these other businesses that need to fill a table tonight. Um, and, and it's going to surface through things like Groupon Now, Living Social, I forget the name of their uh, competitive app, Living Social Live maybe. Um, Groupon's then, actually released a, a, competi a, a competitor to say Level Up and, and oh, yeah. Gowalla mm -hmm. Now where they're trying to Groupon do inverted now. deals. So they're mm -hmm. basically, what, what, we're, what we're seeing is instead of having to buy a, a Groupon up mm -hmm. front, they're, you download an app and you're seeing cash at a place that's trying to incent, yep. incentivize a, a particular, it's a word now incentivize the behavior so you're, you're getting the cash, uh, you go to the place and then if you continue to spend money there, yep. you, uh, you, you basically get more cash. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Um, I would look at, um, he mentioned level up, uh, from, level up from Scavenger, that's another example. The, they're also, as it moves over into mobile, the model itself and the economics are changing. Level up's a good example of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the next inflection point as group buying collides with mobile. The question over here. Um, how do you how do you think the social data can be like combined into the mobile ads? Uh, right now, the, I know you get um, I know you guys mentioned that uh, uh, maybe uh, not maybe already including some uh, some of the social providing information into uh, running the mobile ads, but um, you don't really see like uh, recommendations from your friends and whoever bought this uh, uh, this thing too and whoever. Uh, what do you think the how is that going to change mobile ads in like next 12 months? I think we're going to start to see in, in terms of service that when and people are connecting their social, uh, social networks to, to sites for comments and things of that nature that they're going to be able to pass that data on to ad networks. So you're going to basically see people start to mine that social content to find out what kind of person you are and be able to serve you better content. I mean, that's... That's, that's happening now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to, Facebook Connect gets you somewhat there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there was a uh, keynote uh, yesterday morning, uh, Katie from Facebook, that, who yeah. manages platforms, who just joined the eBay board, talked about how to leverage social uh, within a commerce uh, in enablement, uh, where it's, it's not about likes, but it's what I've read, what I, um, where I ate, and, and those sorts of things. And, and so as we look at that layer, uh, we, we do it within our, uh, our consumer application, we look at the social layer and, and take some of that data and add that to our relevance engine to make recommendations on where to go. Uh, so the, the next evolution is to take that data and, and add that into the, um, in, into the advertising layer uh, to, to make that advertising more relevant based on social, based on context, based on location. You, you can see that, that being also glued to like say Magento or something or your, to your e-commerce platform. We're seeing this, this thing, new phenomenon, social CRM, where basically it's Let's take people's social accounts and, and do that profiling I was talking about, but let's add that to things like uh, sales touch points and transaction touch points so we know full value of that person and, and what it takes to actually get to them. So it's taking what was normally, what could have been, um, you know, either B2B or B2C marketing and make it just person-to-person -person marketing all, all, you know, uh, across the board. Did, did you grab that question off Twitter? 
uh, there was a question about battery life that I answered. Um, somebody asked if um, there were issues with, with battery life relating to geofences, and I said yes, but we can't really worry about that right now because batteries are going to continue to improve. So. This guy in the, yep. in the middle? Right. So your pr prediction around Facebook pushing us off in the next 12 months and Foursquare started doing radar, like sending you um, uh, certain recommendations also. So on mobile particularly, all these things, the creepy factor might be more than desktop. Mm -hmm. How advertisers could handle it better because it could be much faster than we know it. And, and uh, what could advertisers do to handle that uh, creepy factor? We deal with the creepy factor every day in every single ad that we put out there. Um, just the way to do it is to, to make the offer worth it. So um, that, that's one of the ways. And we've got to figure out what the right value exchange is. What, you know, what are people willing to give up to receive? What, what, what will you give up on this side to receive what on this side? And we're trying to optimize that. I mean, that's the generic agency answer to that. Yeah, I think and part of it is just kind of asking yourself, would I be creeped out if I received this? And then number two, there are standards boards like the IAB and the MMA that are trying to kind of put their finger on and establish firm standards for, you know, what does cross the line. Yeah, we, we've been very active with the MMA, the Mobile Marketing Association, uh, to create standards around, uh, you know, what you can use, what you can't use. But I think ultimately, um, you know, to go back to Mike, you've got to make this relevant. You've got, you got to make it engaging. And you've got to understand what the expectations are of the consumer and, and meet those expectations. And, and I think the, the creepy factor is there, no doubt. Um, but, but if you're doing it such a way that you're, um, you're, you're dealing with the, uh, the, the, the PII, the personalized information, uh, you're dealing with location in, in a very sensitive way, you can make it really, really effective uh, for the consumer. You mentioned something about local ad copies having a lot of uh, good conversions. Does the current self-serve platform support uh, the self-serve users to create these local copies or anything like that? I'm sorry, I missed that. So the, the local does, does a platform help them create local ad copies? Because these, as you said, is very relevant in terms of conversions. Yeah, we've done some, uh, some interesting things, um, uh, dynamic things within the ads that we create uh, within the self-service portal. Um, we, we give some freedom to the, to the advertiser. There's a, you know, basically a text field and there's some imagery in there. Um, but we've done a lot of creative things around uh, telling the consumer how far away that advertiser or that location is from their current location. Uh, you know, check out Joe's Pizza uh, two blocks away or a quarter mile away. Um, so, so we use information like that that's uh, network-based um, to, to make that uh, advertising more engaging uh, rather than, uh, you know, because people can be as creative as they can be uh, with, with 30 uh, characters of copy uh, within an ad unit. Um, we, we found that what we engage and how we engage uh, geographically uh, tends to be more important. And Google will do that too, just like they do with search engine marketing. They'll help you with keyword optimization. You'll have ad groups. They'll tell you how they're performing, and you can kind of iterate, A-B tests, et cetera. But the cool thing is that advertisers don't tend to think as dynamically as technologists do, so <laughs> where actually bridges the gap in a lot of ways. Uh, I have a question regarding the location uh, thing that you, regarding geofencing. Okay. The question is that, uh, as I, I know it's true for iPhone, I'm not too sure about Android, is that you can turn the location services off. You have to explicitly authorize location services on your iPhone. Mm -hmm. Correct. So how is that going to work if I'm going to turn my location services off? How is that advertising going to If work? somebody's turning your, their location services off, it's not the person that you want. Uh, they, you weren't going to get them to interact with you anyway. So it's just whittling down the audience to an extent. That's good work. That's a good point. Yep. Okay, this, hello? Okay. this question also regarding the uh, uh, geo offense. And uh, does that work indoor? Does a geo offense work indoors? I'm not sure, actually. Geo, so there's a, there's, that's a good question about precision. Um, we're working on new kinds of uh, new, new ways to become more precise. It does work indoors, but the, the, the question of whether I'm in this room or outside this room with a geofence is still, it's not that precise yet. We're getting better. We're testing it in different ways to do that. Some of them are like, you know, uh, sound waves and things like that. I, there's companies like Shopkick out there who are putting putting sound wave emitters into aisles to tell where, to, to be able to pinpoint exactly where you are, but um, not so much yet. It's getting I think better. the granularity 
question. Um, I, I don't know that we have advertisers out there that are looking for, you know, am, am I in this room or that <laughs> yeah, room? Not or, yet. Or, it, um, we haven't gone down to the last meter problem yet. We're still at a, a last mile and, problem. And the other thing about geofences is, is there's, you know, we look at it in two different ways, right? So you can, you can geofence, you know, this location. This is, this is a building somewhere, and, and this is me. I can have a geofence, a roaming geofence, where you know, I, can, I can move about the world, and when I come into contact with a, a POI that I'm interested in, you know, my phone can do something. It can react to that. So a couple different ways to look at geofences, but yeah, we haven't gotten into the, the, the granular capabilities of indoor. I'm sorry? To answer his question, I think the sort of exciting stuff is coming up in the marker, markerless AR space. So, but you have, someone has to go in to actually create the assets for the AR. So when you walk in a shopping mall and you're actually using the AR yeah. experience, you detect exactly where you are and what you're looking at, and then you can actually have advertising on top of it. So let's say you're inside the mall and there's a Gap store and you move your phone in sure. there. It knows you're in Gap store, it knows you have a, have a special deal and you can actually pop on your screen and then you can actually engage with the store. We, we talked for 45 minutes about mobile advertising. We didn't talk about AR. Mm -hmm. Why is that? So, so you're at the forefront, Mike. What, what's going on? I mean, AR is interesting, but there's very few people who are that inter who are interested in using it yet. I mean, it, it's awesome, but we, we still don't have enough content to do great AR yeah. yet, in my opinion. It's a classic chicken and um, egg scenario. Yeah, it is. So the, the, the thing that you guys are going to be extremely good at and that advertisers may not be as good at or content creators might not be as good at is classification and, and semantics. And, and you guys know better than anybody that... Uh, flexibility is the enemy of analysis. So we're trying right now to create all this great content, but and we're pushing all this content out there, but we may not be tagging it the best way yet. So, I mean, Facebook's kind of doing an interesting thing in that they're allowing you to put different. Now they're they're introducing continuously different semantics that you can put into the data. Location's just the newest. It's kind of the newest one, right? Um, uh, and, and that's what's going to get us to a play, place where we can do really cool augmented reality is classification of content. Cool. So I'm going to wrap things up and, and ask you guys to help me in uh, giving these guys a round of applause. I appreciate their time. And, and I know we'll be off stage over here somewhere to, to take any other further questions. And, and thank you for uh, your, your attention. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.